Hello and welcome to the Psy Guys, the show where we talk about the crazy, weird, and wonderful stories from the science world. I'm Corey, and as always, I'm joined by my co-host, the love-struck Luke Cutforth. That's me. I would hope so. I am married. This week, we're talking about amorous aversion and rejecting romance. But first we got to thank all of our patrons. Oh, thank you, patrons. Why do we need to thank our patrons, Luke? I'm guessing because this is a patron vote episode. You're gosh darn right. So every single month, our patrons get together. They submit some topics. They vote on some topics. It's democratic. It's wonderful. I hate it because they're wrestling the power of this podcast away from my hands. But hey, that's what they get to do. So if you want to have the power to, I don't know, annoy me, why don't you go ahead to the Patreon and sign up? It's like a little council that decides what I get to learn. <laughs> So that's patreon.com forward slash sci guys. Are you ready to learn, Luke? I'm ready to learn. Well, why don't we start by learning a little bit about the people who are watching and listening. So if you're watching or listening, get down to the comments of YouTube and answer this question. I don't care if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, if you're listening on Spotify or listening anywhere else. You go to YouTube, you go to the comments and you answer the question. The question is, are you a romantic? No. You're not a romantic. You're a poor wife, Luke. <laughs> Shut up. You know what I mean. And I know what you mean. What do I mean, Luke? What do I mean when I say a romantic here? You're talking about a romanticism, which is like when you don't feel like romantically attracted to people. That is very true. And that's the topic of today's episode, a romanticism and to some extent, a matter normativity. But we'll get to that a lot later. So you've described what a romanticism is already. I'll give you a little bit more of an in-depth explanation because that's kind of my job here. So aromantic or aero, A-R-O, is an umbrella term used by people who don't typically experience romantic attraction. So that is from um, Stonewall. Good job, Stonewall. Trust them on that, right? Essentially. Um, do you know what romantic attraction is? Can you, can you describe it? Because it's a difficult one to think about, right? Because normally when we think of attraction, we tend not to split it out, um, you know, with with specific words. Yep. We just say, I'm attracted to that person or I've yeah. got a crush on that person. We don't use sort of romantic attraction and all of these other things. Well, I suppose, okay, so I suppose taking that as somebody who experiences multiple types of attraction. You um, greedy little... Oh. <laughs> I would guess that, yes, like you say, I just experience attraction and it's probably a combination of like sexual attraction, or romantic attraction, attraction, various types of attraction. So I would guess that romantic... Romantic attraction is like the feeling of like um, wanting to spend your life with somebody um, as opposed to like you could feel feel sexually attracted to somebody who you'd be like, but I wouldn't want to spend my life with you. But sure, well, we, we, can, we can do the thing, but then go away. But saying that, I mean, there are plenty of people that you spend your life with, aren't there? Yeah. Yeah, but... Are you romantically attracted to me, Luke? <laughs> Sure. You, if you, is that, is that's what you want to believe, Corey? That's not what I want. I, I wanted the opposite answer from that because no, I was leading you to no, something. No, I'm not. I'm not romantic. So that's good because I don't know why, what the difference is necessarily. Because, well, what, what is our relationship? For everyone watching who's not quite aware, why don't you enlighten them as to what, what our relationship is? We're colleagues. Yeah, and so our, our relationship isn't romantic. It's business. Platonic is the word I was looking for. <laughs> and I feel like you know that. You were just trying to be difficult. It's just because you said we were colleagues a few episodes ago. And I was like, right, this is my chance to get you back. We're colleagues. <laughs> but when I did it, it was funny and good for the show. When you did it, it was hurtful and bad for the show. Everyone comment to tell Luke off. <laughs> <laughs> no, so, uh, yeah, romantic attraction. It's that sort of, um, it, it's difficult to describe it without using the word romance, but that sort of, uh, have a sort of romantic, um, I guess, contact or interaction with someone. So that kind of like, you know, the sort of huggy, kissy, oh, ah. I love you, oh, like the Valentine's Day, love hearts and cards and chocolates and, you know, the stuff that you, that you do there. Um, okay, think about it this way, right? If you remove sex from the equation, so any sort of sexual contact, you know, so I'm not going to go through all the different kinds of sex because, you know, we both know them because we've done them all. We're, we're very well versed. So <laughs> I won't go through all those now. But if you remove sexual contact from the equation uh, and then you look at, say, a partner mm. that you have now or you may have had in the past and think about the differences between how you treat them and what you do with them and then what you do with, you know, sort of friends or really, really close friends. That's actually really interesting because, for example, I hug my friends, mm -hmm. but I wouldn't say that I, like, get the feeling of wanting to hug my friends. I hug mm. my friends because, you know, you build, um, you build like, rapport with somebody and... Um, 
you yeah it's just a way of, of building a friendship and that but i don't go like oh i've got a real a real urge to hug cory right now <laughs> but i do get the urge to hug my wife like i want to do that um and i make like make that thing happen so i've never separated that before because i'm very like I'm very physically affectionate with my friends mm. i'm not somebody who's like oh get away from me um but i don't like want to do that in like an enjoyment sense it's more like that's interesting an interaction sense really because there yeah. are friends of mine that i that i enjoy hugging that sure. i'm like oh, i really i want to hug from you really that's nice me. but it's it, it's a platonic hug do you know what i mean there's it's it's interesting because it's difficult to delineate sometimes i guess which thing something is it's one of those things as well like okay i mean you know i don't know if you've ever experienced this but have you ever tried to figure out whether you've got like a crush on someone or whether you want to be friends with someone like what what am i feeling here like do i mm, right, do okay. i like you or do i like 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 you you yeah, know yeah. it's it can be hard to differentiate between those feelings but i mean i guess we all kind of have a feel for what romance is i think you know you can have sensual contact as well that isn't sexual so you know I would say probably like massages, that sort of sensual stuff. That's that that could be kind of under the romance sort of umbrella. It's really it's kind of nebulous to be honest, right? It's not I don't think there's a very clear cut this is romantic and this is platonic and this is sexual. Um because if we if we think about those three things as being wholly separate, I think we kind of open ourselves up for some trouble there because r realistically human relationships don't they don't necessarily fit into strict, strict categories. We mm. just put categories on them and then kind of fall into the expectations of those categories as well, right? Yeah. You know, like there are people who may not necessarily want to kiss their partner or hug their partner, but they'll do it because that's kind of what's expected of them, right? Yeah. I'm not saying that's anyone I know or me. That very much sounds like it's me at this point, but <laughs> I, I, I assure you it's not. What I mean to say is that um, I guess it's kind of veering towards relationship anarchy is the sort of idea that um, th these categorizations that we've got for relationships, they are categories, and like most categories, they're not real. They're useful things to help us, you know, make sense of the world, but don't feel as though you need to fit into one of those mm -hmm. boxes. But the point is that aromantic people don't experience that kind of attraction or experience it uh, to a lesser degree, kind of similar to the asexual spectrum. So mm -hmm. you'll hear a lot of a lot of times um, ace and arrow are put together because asexual people and aromantic people, um, they're, you can see why, you can see why they're kind of grouped together. You know, they're both, um, they're both sort of defined by a lack of this kind of attraction, right? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, a a very diminished amount of distraction or conditional kind of attraction. It's it's a spectrum. It's an umbrella term. The same as, you know, the sort of um, asexual umbrella. So uh, there, there's a few different kinds of aromantic. Do you know any kinds of aromantic? Okay, so I'm guessing one would be like a strict aromantic, as in they're always aromantic. And then one would be like something closer to like demisexual, which mm. is like conditional aromanticism. Like you only feel romantic feelings towards somebody who you know very well, like who you've got to know very well. Um, and then maybe there are some people who feel romantic on some days and don't feel romantic on other days. Sure, yeah. I mean, so demi romantic, yeah, you 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 hit that one right at the right at the gate. Um, it only after you have an emotional connection, which is interesting to me because that's that's one that I can't even I can't wrap my head around with demisexual. Do you know what I mean? Having to have a an emotional connection before you feel any sort of sexual attraction to anyone because I'm just like, do you not seeing someone on the street and being like, yeah. Yeah, you're all right. I sound a bit creepy there, don't I? Gonna... <laughs> Cor it's not possible to go outside with Cory. He's just constantly going, damn, under his breath. Yeah, to, to everyone I see above the age of 18. Uh... <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and below the age of eighty-five. Oh, oh, I was I was so worried about what what you're about to say there. No, eighty-five and up is fine. It depends. It's like, hey, look, it depends. I don't know. I'm not. I'm. I'm not going to judge. But yeah, no. So there. The point here is not necessarily to go through all of the different sort of individual terms that people have come up with to describe their own personal experience of being a romantic. The point is just to understand that aromantic is not just a single term. It's kind of an umbrella term that encompasses lots of uh, you know much. More more specific identities. But the same can be said of anything because categories aren't real and if we want to be specific about who we are, and necessarily we're going to just invent more. You're just going to network. end up at people. Yeah, and until you get people. down to a name yeah. um, and the name just tells you everything yeah. about that person. Yeah. <laughs> That's actually a really good way to run society. Why don't we just name people as a list 
of every single trait that they are specifically. Your name is an entire book about you. And that's how we refer <laughs> Like your name is like a series of letters that you can look up on a centralized... This is starting to sound like left-wing conspiracy theory. Uh, <laughs> liberal elite wants to put everyone in a database. But <laughs> what I mean is like you can just... Yeah, you eventually can just look up... I'm, I'm XZ5624-1. And then mm. you can look up all of my identities inside that's there. That's not what I mean. That's because that's still using categories. Because okay. it needs to be individual because everyone's an individual. So what I'm saying is you have an entire book that you, that you write by yourself that describes every feeling that you have. And right. that way we all know each other on the deepest possible level. But that rules out people who don't really understand themselves at all. Do you know what? If if we're going to have world peace and the only people we oppress are the people who don't understand themselves, that would still be bad, okay? Oppression is bad. I know you thought I was going to say it was going to be fine. No. No. <laughs> So what we do is we do like a weekly MRI scan and that weekly MRI scan knows everything about us and then that, that updates the book. Sure. Okay. Do you know what? Let's move on from this very strange tangent. The point is um, not <laughs> not um, all aromantic people absolutely define themselves exactly the same way. The sort of, the, the thing that joins them is a lack or diminished sort of, I, I don't even like diminished because it kind of sets it in like I guess, a normative comparison. yeah it's a normative yeah. of romantic yeah but you know yeah. low or low or no romantic attraction right um also another key point that is going to be very relevant to today's episode is that not all aromantic people are asexual that's very important to remember because the people studying it <laughs> don't seem to be aware of that We're and i'll get into you. why that is in a little sec but yeah no um asexual and aromantic they're two different things you don't need to be both a lot of people certainly are both um aeroace but that's not a necessity, right? You, you don't have to be aeroace. You could be aromantic and heterosexual, aromantic and bisexual, aromantic and pansexual, all of, all of the different sexuals, you know, and aromantic, uh, because all aromantic describes is your sort of romantic attraction. I mean, if we think about it this way, um, it's almost like a three-dimensional graph. Does that make sense? Yep. What I mean by that is you've got three axes. Oh, I hate this. Uh, <laughs> you've got the you've got the x-axis, the y-axis, and then the the z, the z-axis, which is basically coming towards you, right? Now, um, if you sort of place yourself um, sort of anywhere on that three-dimensional graph, mm -hmm. um, each of those three different axes represent sort of different things. So one axis could be romantic attraction, the other axis could be sexual attraction, um, and the third axis could be the other one that I can't recall right now, but I'm sure people in the comments are going to be telling me um, immediately. But uh... I don't know which one you're talking about, but for example, there is sociosexuality, mm -hmm. which is like the tendency or a lack of tendency for you to uh, want to slash be interested in sleeping with people who you don't know that well. And mm. so that kind of is sort of the demisexual yeah, spectrum. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that was it. So this is this is why I've, I, I mean, and I, I not, in a, not in a very serious way, but I kind of take issue with how demisexual is described as being asexual because it's, sure, if, you know what I mean? If you if you identify as demisexual and asexual, that is entirely your prerogative. I, I don't care. I'm really not bothered about that at all. Mm -hmm. I'm just thinking about sort of the logic of how we're describing this and maybe if there's a better way of understanding it because demisexual is kind of lumping into asexuality something that is quite different. You know, I mean, it's that it's that other dimension. It's like, well, how you know, how do you, how are you attracted to someone? Yeah. I mean, like in, in it, it's, so there's, there's, who are you attracted? To, there's, who are you attracted to, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, romantically, uh, there's who you're attracted to, um, sexually, mm -hmm. and there's how you sort of, you're, how you're attracted to them, how yeah. strongly you're attracted to people. But I suppose it makes sense for the, for demisexual to be on the asexual spectrum because it, your, the, your day-to-day -day life, the majority of your life mm. is is the asexual experience, and then selectively becoming non-asexual. So it, it, even even though you know, if, if the whole purpose of the conversation is to like make people aware of different experiences, if like all your mates are talking about like, oh god, she's really hot, he's really mm. hot, whatever, blah blah blah, that's like ninety percent of your experience is being like, what? Why don't I feel this? I get it. Like demi demi romantic, demi uh, demi sexual. They they make they make sense being grouped where they are. Mm. I, I get that, but they only make sense in on a I guess how do I put it. I guess on a day-to-day -day experiential level, which mm -hmm. is the perfectly valid reason for them to be grouped together. Mm. I, I guess the way to look at this, if we're going to use a very silly analogy that people on people listening to this will almost certainly get, it's like grouping things uh, as fish, right? Uh, rather than you know what I'm, you know what right. I'm trying to get at here. Okay. It's like trying to group group things as fish because they look similar and they live in a similar environment, rather than them being 
actually sort of phylogenetically uh, re- related. You know, mm-hmm. that that's kind of that's kind of what I'm getting at here. It's like, oh, these things are mammals, not because, uh, or rather, sort of. It's like saying anything that flies is a bird, right? Yeah. So this bat is it's a mammal, yeah, but we're calling it a bird because it has wings and it flies. Yeah. Or well, it's like the fish. If the fish had society. <laughs> like them grouping everyone who's not in the sea as like one thing. Yeah. And we're like, but there are lizards and there are mammals and there are birds. But the fish are just like, nah, that's air people. Those are the air people. We don't care about the differences between them. Just you wait till those fish find out about amphibians. They are going to flow. Oh, God. Oh, my God. They're like bisexuals. <laughs> they like live in the sea and also in the air. Goodness me. Okay. Let's right. not tell our children about them. <laughs> No. In case they get ideas. No. Okay, we're <laughs> moving on. So we, we've kind of covered what aromant, uh, what a, being aromantic kind of means, a little bit on romantic attraction and how it's different from sexual attraction and, you know, um, the other one that we mentioned, the sort of... Sociosexuality. That's it. Yeah, yeah, you know, you said the words, Luke. They're not in front of me, so I don't know them. So um, also uh, another sort of misconception. And again, again, this comes from Stonewall. So I am just taking um, this sort of information from Stonewall. I've read around a few different places, but um, Stonewall, they're very good at this. They're, they're very good at the sort of information they provide. So yeah, um, aromantic people can be in relationships. You know, I, I don't want to be mentioning asexual people a lot in this episode because, you know, they often get grouped together. and I don't want to make it seem like, ah, this is an episode about aromantic people, but actually sneaky. It's an asexual episode. Um, but m- my point here is that people often think, you know, asexual people, well, they'll, they'll, they'll never have sex. They don't like sex because they're asexual. Not the case. Romant- aromantic people, they can still have a relationship. Uh, they can still be in uh, what is, I guess, functionally like a romantic relationship, right? In the same sense that you could still be in a sexual relationship with someone who is asexual. But, um, but I mean, beyond that, romantic relationships aren't the only kind of relationship there are. We kind of touched on that. But there are also, the, there are a lot of other really deep relationships that people can have in their lives. Like, you know, friendship. You know, It's this sort of idea that we've built up culturally that you need to be, you know, in a romantic relationship uh, for that relationship to be valued. I mean, marriage is literally between people that are you know, in love with each other. There's no real way to build a life with someone that you love deeply, just not romantically, you know? As in, like, there isn't structurally. Yeah, structurally. In, in our society, there's not really, unless you sort of go down the route of pretending to be together, yeah. um, you can't necessarily... It's, for tax reasons. For tax reasons, yeah. But I mean, but also you're, you're I think, uh, I don't know if this is... Um, this is this is anecdotal, so massive grain of salt. But I've been I've been told this by a couple of people, so look into it yourselves. Um, apparently, you might have better chances with buying a house if you say that you are married to the person you're buying the house with. Oh, I'm yeah. almost certain you will. Yeah, no, I, I you're I'm a lower, you're considered a lower risk. Yeah, for various reasons. Yeah. Absolutely, I just don't have any data to back me up on that right at this moment. So I'm going yeah. to be very very clear about that. Uh, but look it up yourselves. I I think it might be the case, but you know. You can't be too safe. But yeah, no. So, you know, there's there's things like that where we really sort of, we value um, romantic relationships a lot. But they're not the only kind of relationship you can have. You know, you can have friends, family, platonic partners. Um, there's also something called queer platonic relationships. Have you heard of a sort of queer no. platonic relationship? No? no? Any idea what it might be? Uh, queer platonic, platonic relationships. Um, is it, okay, so it's de- okay. So it's not going to be, the thing that we loved hearing about, which is like, look at these two women sharing a friendship kiss in 19, <laughs> 9, 1915. Look at how good friends they are. They lived together for their entire life. It's kind of the opposite of that. Okay, yeah, exactly. It's, so yeah. so it's, um, oh gosh, what? Okay, wait, what is the opposite of that? Okay, so- Because the opposite me, of that to me is like two people pretending to be gay. No. So, okay, here's, here's what you've kind of presented to me. Here are two people of the same sex or same gender who um, live closely together and they are in a relationship, but I am assuming that they're not in a relationship. Yes. So the opposite of that would be looking at a couple who are, you know, again, uh, same se- same gender, same sex, um, who live together, who are not in a romantic relationship, um, but, but everyone's people think they might be because of the how close. So, you know, a queer platonic relationship, it, it, it's kind of basically a romantic relationship without the romance, you know? Or the sex. Well, yeah, you can have sex as well. Sure. Yeah, I, yeah. You can, I, I mean, the thing is, uh, queer people have sex with their friends a lot. 
as I'm look, I'm one of them. I can say that all all I'm saying is it's a very very incestuous uh, incestuous time when you <laughs> when you're in a when you're in a friend group with a bunch of gays. But why is this called a queer platonic relationship? Okay, so I'm not actually sure why it's called a queer platonic relationship. I have two ideas for it, um, and I'm pretty sure that one of them will be the case, or perhaps both of them could be the case. So queer platonic in that it's queering a platonic relationship, or queer platonic as in it's uh, a kind of platonic relationship that is. Uh, specifically deep and is generally only really found amongst queer people because just because of the way that societally we don't really value platonic relationships um men and women tend to not be able to be in a close platonic relationship without there being the expectation of there being in a romantic mm-hmm. relationship um and you know same for two men who are heterosexual there's being in a very very close relationship with another man as a straight man there's a level where bromance, you know, does not, you know, does not save you anymore, sort of culturally speaking, right? So, I mean, two women, I guess, could could do that, maybe two straight women. But then again, it's just, it's like, it's maybe less common, especially because as a straight person, you're much more likely to be able to easily fit into the sort of cultural expectation mm-hmm. of finding, a, finding you know, a, a spouse and having kids, you know, all of that sort of stuff. And um, yeah, so a queer photographer relationship is essentially... You know, living together, for for example, you'd be living together, sharing finances, all of the sort of domestic stuff that you would sort of associate with, I guess, a marriage or, you know, um, a romantic relationship. The only difference being you're not romantically involved with each other. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not like, oh, I want to kiss you romantically. (laughs) Uh, Maybe I want to kiss you platonically, but not romantically. (laughs) Because, you know, there's things like platonic cuddles and stuff. You know, you could sleep together with your friends. Uh, You could have sex with your friends as well. Like, this is, this is what's really good i think about lgbtq plus people the, the, the homophobes are right we are absolutely going to destroy society it's just the parts that need to be destroyed um you know the parts that place expectations on people based on what's between their legs when they're born or the parts that say you need to find this type of person and then uh get 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 to the government to say that you're going to stay together forever and then pop out a couple kids and then raise them to do the same that's that's your job you know like it, tearing down the expectations of that i think is very good because it, it just allows people to be more comfortable in who they are and just do what they want rather than following what it is they're told to do that's really funny Yes, they actually are going to tear down society as we know it, but in a good way. Oh my God. But like in a good way. No, in a good way. Like though. as in like what I mean by that is that often it sounds like um, when when that le- accusation is leveled at people who are maybe like basically more progressive for mm. a variety of reasons. Um, the suggestion is it's essentially like conservatism, right? Let's keep yeah. the society exactly the way it is. These people want to change it, and it's like, well, no, these people want aren't like. So the societal structures as they are do not cater to these people in yeah. a way that is unfair. They want to change those into ways that it is fair. And so you're kind of not wrong that they are going to change society as you know it. Mm. It's just that the way it is and the way all the way it was, was unjust. And that's why it's being changed. But crucially as well, they're not going to change it for you all that much, probably. If, no. it, as I've said many a time, you know, on on my other channels, you can go and follow me there if you want. Um, if you want to live a little trad wife life, you know, you can live your little trad wife life. Just don't tell other people that they have to do that too. That is the point. You yeah. can do what you want. We want to do what we want and let you do what you want, so long as you don't hurt anyone else. That is uh, literally they, it. That that's the crucial bit. They want it. They want to live in a world where people like that don't exist. Yeah, I don't mean like. No, I, I, mean, I get you. I mean that they want to live in a world where, like, a nice little simulated world where those people don't don't actually exist because like, they're quiet about it. Mate, I've seen people. I've seen the people that are calling for tra- transgenderism to be um, eradicated. You know. Um, I wonder how you're going to do that when there's so many trans people. I wonder mm. how those two things are connected. Yeah, mm. yes. To I mean, to some extent, it's a sort of I guess cognitive dissonance there, where it's like I don't want these people, I don't want this thing to exist, um, and this thing just so happens to be an integral part of these people. Yeah, you know, it's it's really it's it's insane. You know, I've seen people you know uh, it's, uh, levy the accusation of groomer just for being not straight and around children that's it that's all that's that is the bar now you know forget actually grooming children you know which there's been a lot of cases of people who are quite conservative doing also hey catholic church 
<laughs> um, yeah, no, forget all of that, you know. Um, the bar is now don't be straight and um, be near someone who is under 18. But, you know, uh, forgetting all of them and getting back to um, some more stuff about aromantic people. So uh, Stonewall has asked me personally through an article that they posted and um, did not tell me about it at all. And I found myself and decided to read. Um, they have told me to tell you that aero people aren't cold and heartless. Ah. Oh. Which is good. Oh, God, it's I need good to start to taking notes. <laughs> <laughs> I'll say this as well. I meant to say this up top. I wanted to get someone who was aromantic for this episode. I did try. I reached out to someone who I thought was aromantic, uh, who might have been aromantic at one point. They are no longer aromantic, but they are cold and heartless. <laughs> so <laughs> this must be true. I know exactly what you're talking about. I know you don't. Well, that's, that, that's, why, that's why it's so funny. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, my point is that, um, yeah, I, look, we, I tried to reach out to someone and I, I, I just, I could not find someone that meets the sort of specifications of living in London or being able to sort of call in at the times when we record and, um, you know, has some knowledge on the subject and you know, is is someone that I know and trust. I, I cannot find someone that is aromantic that filled all those boxes in time for this episode, unfortunately. That is the way of Patreon vote episodes. But perhaps if we do something uh, related to this topic in the future, we can have an aromatic, aromatic person on to chat about their experiences. Yeah, that is something I'd really value um, because I... So it's like, for example, when we did we did an episode on um, asexual asexuality and I definitely came to that episode with the preconception that asexual people don't enjoy sex. And I had that shattered because I was like, oh, wow, they, they don't experience sexual attraction or less se they experience less sexual attraction, but they can enjoy the physical act of sex still. That's just really interesting. And like, there's a, le a level of nuance there, which I really appreciated. So now I want to understand how an aromantic person has a romantic relationship, well, like how that works. I mean, I think you can be in a romantic, re a sort of romantic-esque relationship. Yeah. I mean, big, bear in mind. When I say aromantic, you're probably thinking someone who experiences absolutely no uh, romantic attraction under that is also true, any yes. circumstances. Yeah. And someone who, in, th in that case, may not um, want to be in a romantic relationship. Mm -hmm. I mean, but they may well want to. You know, if there's someone, if you think about it, sometimes there's sometimes there's compromises. If there's someone in your life who you deeply love mm -hmm. and they want to be in a relationship with you that has romantic elements, yeah. then... You know, by all means, go ahead. But again, this is what I was talking about up top. This strict categorization between sort of sexual, romantic, um, you know, platonic relationships, mm -hmm. these dividing lines. Because, <sighs> yeah. like, again, some people think of hugging and kissing as being something you really only do with your partner, right? right. Generally. Yeah. Some people think of, um, you know, one thing is cheating where other people will not think of mm -hmm. that as cheating. We all have different sort of boundaries and... and um, things, different actions and different sort of, you know, um, different things have different meanings, essentially, uh, yeah. to each person is the point here. Um, another another thing that Stonewall's asked me personally to tell you uh, is being aero isn't just a phase. I know that that's something that you've right. been spouting Again, recently. Let me write this down. Yeah, please do. Oh, um, God, I'm learning everything today. They're gotta, not cold and heartless and it's not just a phase. You got a lot to add Blowing to this apology, buddy. Blowing my mind. <laughs> I hope you're going to make a public apology for all of the slanderous things you've been saying about aromantic people. I've been people. saying nothing but slander for years. <laughs> so, yeah, um, uh, also, aromantic people are part of the LGBTQ plus community. This is, um, this is something that is weirdly contentious. I mean... I'm not I'm not going to lie. I do understand where people are coming from to some extent when they're saying these people aren't part of the community. And when I say I understand where they're coming from, that's not to say I'm, that I'm validating what they're saying. What I'm saying is that I can understand how they would uh, how they would arrive at the conclusion they have using the logic that they do. Yeah. If that makes sense, yeah. right? But the fundamental fact is that the LGBTQ plus community is not something that you can just gatekeep like that. You can't just boot out people who are, you know, uh, sort of, I guess, sexual minorities, let's say, as the, as the sort of, um, or, you know, minorities in terms of attraction, right? Mm. Um, you Or orientation. You, you can't just boot people out because they're not convenient to you or because they don't fit your idea of what someone who, you know, what an LGBT person should B, you know, I mean, the LGBTQ plus community, it, it, you, we've got queer people that that could be anyone that's sort of, you know, just off, off the sort of, you know, straight and narrow, let's say, mm -hmm. you know, um, anyone who isn't straight, you, you've you got intersex people in the LGBTQI plus QIA plus community as well. So many letters, right? We should get another name for it. But, um, you know, you've got, um, you've got intersex people, there, there's so many different sort of groups of people in this. And 
saying aromantic people just shouldn't belong there is why what are you gaining you know there there are uh, even if we say that this is a sort of politically sort of um, a, a group that's cobbled together politically from different groups of sexual or or like you know uh, sexual minorities or uh, minorities in terms of uh, orientation whether it be romantic sexual anything like that you know um even if we say that they're cobbled together from you know people like that well aromantic people genuinely the world isn't really sort of set up for them as i've I've kind of laid out there are expectations that you know you um have to you have to sort of be romantically attracted to people and you have to get married and you have to have kids and all of these sort of romantic things that people tend to do with each other and if you want to do those things you need to be in a romantic relationship with someone you know you can't just do it with someone that you're really close friends with you can't just have a kid with someone that you're really close friends with and you can but it's the the like the systems that we have in place just aren't really set up for that yeah there are real there are real like tax implications to mm. being non-normative if you want to put it like that like you know there obviously there's the 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 real physical real world like base reality mm. difference of like lots of the people you know might not understand you or lots of people you know will talk about things that you that don't resonate with you mm. that's like real world stuff and then there's like our societal structural taxation implications which are like you're probably financially incentivized to get married yeah. and things like that and so yeah the, 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 we sort of compound the the differences between people um by the structures that we create which are generally suited for straight romantic cisgendered people yeah absolutely white, who are white probably as well yeah yeah absolutely yeah. <laughs> no you're, you're spot on i mean yeah i just think that um that sort of mindset is antithetical to what the lgbtq plus community should be exactly and i think that's why you know when you're talking about um asexual people or aromantic people or uh, lots of different people being in the lgbtq plus community it's ultimately because these people are banded together by the fact that the society doesn't really work for them mm. in the way that it does for everybody else. And they have been sort of propagandized since they were very young, in uh, sometimes deliberately and sometimes, like, um, incidentally, to be told there is something wrong with them they need to fix. Yeah. And that is a very um, sort of uh, resonant, very kind of... Uh, joining experience and using poor words there but I, like, yeah. I mean I understand you completely and the one last sort of thing I would say here is that a very obvious caveat and I'm not even going to get into the specifics of why this caveat is necessary because I know that people are already in the comments trying to make me look silly by bringing up something um, that they think is a trump card. It isn't, because what I'll say to you is you can be a part of the LGBTQ plus community so long as your sort of identity, the identity that you've got or your orientation or whatnot is not inherently harmful. So if you've got, say, an orientation oh, no. that you think is that you oh, think no. should be part of the LGBTQ plus community, but it is inherently harmful and inherently violates consent, that's not part of the LGBTQ plus community because it causes harm to others. The LGBTQ plus community is about achieving equality and sort of freedom for people to be themselves so long as they don't harm others. Yep. That's it. That's it. Golden rule. Very, very easy. You know, the golden rules treat others as you want to be treated, but screw it. Nah, treat, don't harm anyone. Do what you want. Don't harm anyone. That's the golden rule. But um, yeah, so that's sort of why, you know, that's sort of an intro to what aromanticism is and why aromantic people are part of the community. People who are watching this for the first time are probably thinking, why have they not spoken about the science yet? Well, we're about to speak about the science in just a sec. I first want to talk a little bit about um, sort of romantic attraction and orientation. We'll get into a little bit of science of it here, but um, we, we, if we're going to get into like the real nitty gritty science of aromanticism, you're going to have to wait a long time for that one, buddy. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't hold your breath. We'll get to it, but. <laughs> <laughs> A ding a ling a ling. Is that the ad bell? The ad bell sounds different today. I'm not sure what's up. Because it's telling us about a different show. It's not telling us about Psy Guys. It's telling us about After Dark. After Dark is the show that happens after Psy Guys has ended. Do you know anything about it, Luke? After Dark is a separate show to Psy Guys. But you know in Psy Guys where we have a conversation, we kind of veer off topic and we kind of need to bring it back on topic because we're doing a topic. But those conversations are also really good in and of themselves. It's a whole show of just that. You mean it's a whole show of just the good fun bits of Psy Guys? without any of the dirty, boring science? That's exactly what I'm saying. I hate science. If you're like Luke and you hate science but love listening to Luke talk, you can go ahead to our Patreon and (laughs) sign up to After Dark. So romantic attraction and orientation. I mean, what do you think 
romantic love is or what do you think the purpose of romantic love is well those are two very different things and i was kind of thinking about this when you were talking about um a an aromantic person like still being in a, a romantic a relationship is that there is probably a reason why um and i use that word lightly um but there's a reason why <laughs> romantic attraction evolved there are animals that do not have romantic attraction and we are one of the animals that do and other animals probably experience something roughly analogous to romantic attraction yeah. animals that sort of mate for life or mate for seasons or that kind of thing and it's to do i would imagine it's to do with there being a biological or genetic advantage to sort of bonding with somebody sort of sticking with that person being able to rely on that person and that person being able to rely on you invest in that person share resources all those kind of things will in some ways, um, in certain ways, sort of uh, advantage, advantage you over people who might not have done that in sort of the evolutionary history. Um, I would imagine. And, and so that the point being there, that then if somebody doesn't experience those things, firstly, that's not wrong. There, yeah. are, there are plenty of, of, of reasons or plenty of examples of very successful um, creatures which uh, do not experience that that. Feeling and also very successful people and very yeah well people are creatures but well, I just feel I feel as though aromantic people <laughs> Sorry, might not yes. want to be I'm trying, described I'm trying as successful here. creatures. So, no, no, I know, I'm I know. trying here, but my point being is that you could sort of, as an aromantic person, sort of observe the landscape of the world and sort of analyze why it would actually still be beneficial to you to be in a a relationship with one person. To, that person feels romantic attraction to you, even if you don't necessarily know what it what that is like for them. And you can sort of logically still decide to do all the things which romantic attraction incentivizes you to do because you understand that um, there are benefits to that behavior. It's just basically a feeling which incentivizes you towards a behavior. And you can still do the behavior without the, without the feeling necessarily. Okay, I 100% agree with you. Yeah. And I guess to sort of elucidate this idea a little bit further... Um, let me just say that we are all dum-dums. We're all stupid heads. We're big dumb apes, big dumb mammals. And it's not just mammals that are dumb. Every single living creature is dumb. And I don't mean that in a sort of sense of intelligence. What I mean is that you cannot just expect a thing to survive just because. Mm -hmm. The reason that we got all these feelings in our heads and all of these things going on is because it's tricking us into surviving. Mm. Why do you feel hungry? Because dum dum, you wouldn't eat otherwise. You feel okay? hungry because you want to stick literal wheat inside your face hole. <laughs> no, you feel hungry because feel good. And sticking wheat in your face hole make you live. Well, this is the thing. Sticking wheat in your face hole make you live. Therefore, must feel good because this dum dum won't do it otherwise. Absolutely. Like, and and I mean, I say that we're dumb, but I feel like humans have kind of got to a point almost where. There are some biological processes that incentivize us to do things that, well, I wouldn't say aren't necessary. What I'll say is we don't necessarily need those biological incentives in order to recognize that that's an important thing that we should do. For example, if I suddenly stopped feeling hungry ever, I already tend to not feel hungry ever, mm -hmm. but I still do eat daily, if I remember, because I recognize that it's something that is you know, Im imperative to my survival, yes. right? So while I may not get the biological marker of, hey, buddy, you need to st you need to stick thing in face, feel good, so live, you know, while I may not get that, my brain is like, think the other part of my brain, you know, the, the, the smart boy part of my it's brain is like, yeah. hey, buddy, um, now, now we know that that dumb part of your brain is not working quite right. But let, let's let's just do the eating anyway, because we need to survive. And that's your prefrontal cortex, I would imagine, which is like your um, sort of higher thought, higher in quotes, thought of like self-modeling, of like observing yourself and seeing what's good for you, even if you don't. Order. And that's basically exactly what I was describing about a, 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 the possibility of an aromantic person being in what would at least look like a romantic relationship, where if, and I am massively stressing if, somebody makes the comes to the conclusion that a traditional um, monogamous romantic relationship or uh, observe, like looking romantic relationship um, is beneficial in some way. Someone can use their prefrontal cortex to decide to do it, even though they don't have the automatic um, sort of feeling to do it. Well, yeah. I mean, think about this. Um, arranged marriages work. I mean, I know we... I 
I know as a Western sort of society, we tend to look down upon mm-hmm. arranged marriages. And sure, there there may be there may be problems there, but also there's like a 50% divorce rate, you know? Non-arranged marriages also don't work. I think something that I've come to understand about arranged marriages, just from sort of listening to people talk about them, is that the interesting thing there for me is that marriage can just be like a, a lot of work. Like you're, you're, you've got a partner that you work together with to achieve a goal. It's just in this case, it's like life goals and you also like then have kids with them and all of that sort of stuff. But also you can kind of fall in love with, with any, like people think about like soulmates and oh, you need to like, this is the person for me. But was it, is it, is it not been shown in some studies that um, you're quite likely to fall in love with someone that is just kind of around you? It's 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 um mm, it's proximity know. more than any more than <laughs> sort of anything else that uh predicts for who you will end up. Really? Yeah, apparently yeah. so. Um, please look that up to double check. Uh, because again, this one is off the top of my head. But yeah, no, I mean, the the, the thing the thing that I'm getting at here is that. I don't think love is as imperative as we kind of make it out to be. You know, you don't need to love someone to work well with them. I, I don't love you romantically, and yet we we've built this little baby <laughs> for four years, huh? Ah, uh, this yeah. little, this little. Ah, oh, there uh, you go. We're in, we're in, the, we're in this baby. We're right in now. the baby. Wow, <laughs> sorry guys. But you, you know what I mean? Like you know, you, you don't need to have that romantic connection in order to have a lifelong commitment to someone. Mm-hmm. You don't need to have that romantic connection to raise a child effectively with someone. And if anyone is thinking, oh well, if they don't have a mom and a dad and their parents are together, it's going to be okay. Think about this. What about a divorced couple? who are still co-parenting a child, and they have a healthy platonic relationship. That kid's parents are, you know, not together. They're in a platonic relationship raising a child. Yes, they were in a romantic relationship at one point, but at this point, it's platonic. That's perfectly fine. Like, it it is genuinely perfectly fine to raise a child with someone that you only have a platonic relationship with. You know, even if, whether you're living together or not, I've seen stories of, you know, a couple who got divorced, separated, but they lived together, they continued to live together to give the kids a sense of stability until, you know, they, they grew up and moved out. And if you're able to do that, in a, if you're able to healthily do that, by all means, go ahead. But yeah, what I'm trying to get at here is that, you know, romantic love is not a necessary requirement for a full life or, you know, to raise children or even to engage in the world, um, you know, in, in the way that most people do. The only difference is that you're not going to be feeling that romantic connection with someone necessarily, right? Um, and I mean, yeah, we were, we were talking about sort of where that came from and sort of the use of it. And yeah, it did likely evolve because it's beneficial in sort of rearing young, essentially, right? You know, if you've got one person that you're like, this is my person and we are gonna just, we're gonna mate together and then we're gonna raise what comes what comes out, right? That makes sense because you've got less sort of randomness there. You've you kind of got, you're set, right? For life, essentially. You, you, only gotta, you only gotta try and find a mate one time and then you're good. It's actually a really interesting example of where like, so it take, take what you just said, like, Obviously, it's very complicated. It's more complicated than I'm about to say it is. Yeah. But like in that sense, the gene, if there were a gene or the set of genes mm-hmm. for romantic attraction are there not because it is beneficial to the person who is romantically attracted, but because it is beneficial to the child who also carries the gene. Mm which is super interesting in the same way that um, in Darwin's book about, sorry, Darwin's book? Um, Dawkins. Dawkins' book about um, genetics, the selfish gene. It's a very big difference, Darwin and Dawkins. <laughs> sorry, yeah. Um, in Dawkins' book about, um, about genetics, the selfish gene, he talks about how the gene for one puppy in a litter dying like almost voluntarily is there because it is... And, and that puppy will do it because that copy is also in all the puppies or many of the puppies that also don't die. So it's there for the benefit of the ones that don't die. Yeah. with When it comes to evolution, it is beneficial to look at it on, I guess, three different levels of scale. One is a sort of very macro level of, I guess, sort of, I mean, there's two different sort of macro levels, but sort of more species uh, and or population, mm. you know. Um, so you've got, I mean, there's maybe let's say four levels that you could you could make many different levels but let's say you've got species level right Mm -hmm. how each species interacts with each other species then you've got this sort of intra um this sort of intra uh, competition there um um, or intra species competition so within the species so you've got you know between different populations you know and you can say well you've got between different sort of like you know families or different sort of you know like groups of genes and then you get really into it you could just talk about the genes themselves which 
kind of is similar to families there. Mm -hmm. And you don't get the full picture unless you look at all of these different things. Because as you're saying there, a puppy dying doesn't seem to make sense if you're looking at it on the scale of an individual sort of creature. But looking at it on scale, looking at evolution on the scale of an individual creature is the worst way to try and understand evolution because evolution does not care about you. Evolution does not care about an individual. It, it, it does not matter. Evolution doesn't care about anything. It's not a person. It's not... It's, it, it, evolution is just a process that happens and the way the process works is that whatever whatever works to make a thing survive long enough to have offspring and then have those offspring survive long enough to have that's 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 what happens that's generally what happens there's obviously other things that come into it different pressures and uh different factors that, that will affect that but fundamentally it is just a case of what is kind of the first thing that works the best out of the things that it's up against to make sure that this this thing can make offspring and that offspring can then... <laughs> or that this gene it c continues to propagate in other things that are not me. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, when I say, yeah, so when I say, even saying this thing, right, so this, um, this, yeah, th th this gene can go on, right, yeah. essentially. But, uh, ah, so complex, so much fun, <laughs> but that's not what we're talking about today. Uh, but yeah, no, so um, pair bonding um, is kind of the, I guess, precursor to romantic love. I mean, it is essentially just romantic love, right? You know, 90% um, of mammals apparently don't pair up to, you know, rear young. I mean, some birds um, pair up. I mean, I, I've heard of some sort of reptiles pairing. Aww, but, I don't know why that's really sweet, but that's really sweet. But um, I, I, uh, off the top of my head, it's really tough to kind of remember that. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, that's kind of that's kind of what you've what you've got there. Um, you know, um, sort of uh, pair bonding to, I guess, generally raise young. But it's not just raising young as well. You know, I mean, like, obviously, it's the same as, you know, trying to move into a house in London. You're going to move in by yourself. You're going to move in with someone else who can share, you know, share the burden of gaining resources. You know, uh, that is that is generally beneficial that's kind of where society has come from you share the burden of you know generating resources that you need to survive um if we just briefly talk about sort of what romantic love is um do, do you have any idea what causes love goodness me i can sing you a decade plus old song from uh <laughs> from what charlie is love? And like. or what is love baby don't hurt me are you think you're talking about uh neuropinephrine neuropinephrine uh, although that song, the chemical song by Charlie Sokolik. Chemical Love by Charlie Sokolik. That's the one, yeah. Oh, I can, and please I, sing me that song. I want to get copyright striked by Charlie. To, I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. I don't want to <laughs> do on, it. Come on, you promised. You said you could. You offered. I'll do it off pod, Luke. No, I'll do it off no, pod. We're all waiting. We're all <laughs> waiting. We want to hear Chemical Love by Charlie and Sokolik. No, we're up in there, Dopamine's bad. I don't know what it is, man. I'm sorry. I can't sing. You know that. <laughs> I, I, we don't want to get. Do you know what? I can sing. I just don't want to get in copyright strike. So I got to yeah. do it as bad as possible. Yeah. You know. You yeah. know. Do it for the lawyers, <laughs> or don't do it for the lawyers. <laughs> So, romantic love, it's uh, chemicals in your brain. I mean, again, if you listen to a decade and a half old song from a British YouTuber, you might know. But what, what, sort, of, what sort of things are going on in your head that make you love people? Well, there's going to be some, some dopamine, some norepinephrine, uh, <laughs> some... Um, uh, oh, what's the one that makes you racist? <laughs> it's the one that makes you love people. People who are close to you, but also makes you racist. I thought that was... Is it oxytocin? Maybe. The bonding one. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. It makes you want to cuddle your kids, but it also makes you racist. <laughs> <laughs> it does. No, I'm not. I mean, I'm massively oversimplifying, but that is kind of... It's a really, really weird way to try and get out of being... <laughs> like, it's not my fault. It's hey, the neurotransmitter in my hey, brain, It's bro. the cuddle hormone. <laughs> yeah, so um, the difficulty here, though, is that whenever you're like, oh, which is the one that does that? I can't remember because they all do different things. Oh, sorry, they all do multiple different things. Yes. And sometimes they, they do similar things, yeah. but they, they don't... Look, uh, there are a bunch of different um, neurotransmitters and neuropeptides that sit in your brain and they, they buzz around. They, they buzz about and then your brain feels things, basically. Yeah. Okay, look, I could have described this much better. I don't want to. You can find another episode or an actual scientist to describe it to you. So essentially what's going on here is some chemicals in your brain are bouncing about and they make you feel this feeling the same way as you feel other feelings, but um, it becomes specific to a person, right? The really interesting thing about like our sort of public, um, like top line uh, conversations about things like dopamine as well, is that dopamine is actually 
It's actually not a very good description of what it does, because actually what's more relevant is where in the brain it's being released. And mm. the, re- the example I'll give you is that we think a lot about dopamine being um, the... like. So lots of people talk about dopamine being like the reward chemical, mm. but it also is then separately discussed as like, no, it's not the reward chemical, it's, it's involved in motivating you towards reward. Mm-hmm. But I did some research on this recently, actually. And it turns out that, now again... I might not, I might not be fully understanding this, but as far as I can understand, dopamine is involved in that feeling of craving of something, mm-hmm. but is also involved and released when you get the reward. It's just that the feeling of it of the reward versus the feeling of the craving is because dopamine is being released in different parts of the brain. That makes so much sense. So the idea that dopamine is the craving or that dopamine is the reward, these are ultimately just like, it's like saying, um, whenever I send a love letter, I put it in this certain type of envelope. Mm -hmm. But I also put letters that I send to my lawyer in the same type of envelope. Mm -hmm. And then saying the envelope is is what creates the lawsuit or the envelope is what creates the love letter. It's like, no, that's just a sort of... the way the message gets sent. Mm. And yes, this type of chemical is heavily involved in this thing, but it can also do other stuff. Serotonin does stuff in the gut with digestion. This is the thing, yeah, I think it helps to understand that your body is very economical in that um, what it will do is use and reuse things. And the way that these neurotransmitters work is they... they (laughs) It's quite physical, right? Mm. It's quite a physical thing in your head. So, uh, I, I mean, all that needs to happen is it's not like the dopamine is whispering to you know one of your one of your little brain cells, and be like, "Hey, you feel this now." It it's just kind of having a little sort of interaction with it, and so that interaction doesn't really mean anything other than you're interacting with this chemical mm-hmm. or a chemical that's similar in structure to this chemical, right? So that's why in different areas of the brain, it can mean different things. Mm. Because Luke and I can have a code, you know, I think we've described this before. Luke yeah. and I can have a code where I say wave. Um, and, you know, if I wave to Luke, that means hello. But if I wave to a different friend, that could be the same gesture, but a totally different, it could mean something totally different. Mm-hmm. For example, as well, I mean, another another good one is ASL and BSL, uh, mm-hmm. British Sign Language and American Sign Language, not respectively. Um, and that's not because I don't respect the languages. <laughs> I just said them in the wrong order. <laughs> um, no. So BSL and ASL, and they might have similar signs um, amongst them. I, I, I don't know them both fluently. Uh, I barely know BSL. So if there are any sort of shared signs, they could still have different meanings. Same with words that sound similar between different languages, mm-hmm. right? You could have a word that sounds exactly the same uh, as uh, in, in English. You could have a word that sounds exactly the same as a word in Russian. They have two completely different meanings. Mm-hmm. So acting like this word has this universal meaning amongst everything, it's just, it's not the case. Even have it within languages with homophones, right? Mm-hmm. You know, um, it's it, it's the sim- it's a similar sort of idea there. But all we need to take away from this is that romantic love is generally for raising young um, and, you know, um, you know, sort of sharing those sort of the burden of resources. And um, it's also not super necessary for modern life. And it's generally just caused by some chemical reactions in your brain as are like all feelings. That's all you are. You're a bunch of chemical reactions in a hunk of meat that's inside a skeleton that's inside a bunch of flesh and skin. That's what you are, buddy. Feel it right now. Feel all of the <laughs> feel all of the little connections, all of the nerves running up to your brain, all of all of the blood in the bones. That's what you are. You're just a sack of meat with chemical reactions going on. Thanks for the existential crisis, Cory. You're welcome, Luke. You know you can trust me for one of those. So before we kind of, you know, move on a little bit further, I just want to really quickly touch on the studies that I looked at because I did look at studies for today. This is a science podcast, and so I did look at scientific studies. I really struggled. I told you this before. I was really mm. struggling with this episode because I agreed to do it. Um, I, I am I am allowed to caveat a, a you know, a Patreon vote episode if there is not a topic there. For example, I had to caveat um, one recently that was on the Russian sleep experiment, which I thought, oh, that sounds cool. And then when I went to research it, I found out that it was a creepypasta. And so it it's it, it was just a story. Sorry, what is a creepypasta? A creepypasta is like a copypasta, but it's scary. What's, so it's a, like, what's a copypasta? A copypasta is like just sort of a, a generally a copypasta is like a sort of funny, um, a funny sort of like meme um, sort of paragraph or, or, or block of text that one copies and pastes into mm. somewhere else and the, the joke of it is sort of um just having that block of text so for example um gosh uh the sort of one that i remember from um you know a few years ago is like what did you just say to me you little sh- i'm a marine blah 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 and you know the long you know that mm. long thing where it's threatening someone um you know there's different there's different is, copy- is loss one it's not copy pasta but loss is more of a meme copy right. pasta is specifically sort of text you know right. it'd be copy paste 
is what yeah. it means, right? Yeah. Oh, okay. So there's like one going around at the moment. Like you have to be all levels of um, uh, gay and religiously repressed. That's, that's just a meme now. It's isn't kind of it? a meme. Nah. So, uh, copy pasta is a kind of a meme. It's a yeah. type of meme. Um, <laughs> Trust this show to be talking about copy pasta. Oh, it's aromaticism. like the, where people would just tweet the entirety of the B movie script. Kind of, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. B movie. I was thinking that the B movie is a lot closer. Yeah, like even so, you, the B movie sort of script, like B moving someone, B moving someone for if if you don't know, gosh, this is gonna this is gonna <laughs> age us. No. <laughs> Back in, back a few years ago, you were able to send the entire B movie script to someone in a text, but that would often brick their phone because. <laughs> <laughs> because phones couldn't really withstand like take yeah. that much, and if you were willing to pay for all the texts, because you had to pay per text back then, uh, um, you could do that. Uh, I had unlimited texting, and I would regularly crash my friend Lindsay's phone. Sorry, Lindsay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I did it more than once. I'm pretty sure. No, so um, yeah, B uh, moving uh, was sending the entire B movie script to someone, and then it kind of shorted to that first line from the script, which is you know like uh, oh, according to all the known, known laws of aviation, a bee basically shouldn't be able to fly. Blah, which blah, isn't blah, blah. true. It's the, yeah, sure. If you do a back of the envelope um, uh, sort of calculation, uh, looking at a bee as though it's a fixed wing aircraft, yeah, sure, a bee shouldn't be able to fly. But luckily, bees are not fixed wing aircraft, are they? But one opening line to a movie. Such a good Brilliant. movie. Such a good opening line. But no, it's almost as good as I'm running through the yard with my pants around my ass and it's raining on my. So you'll say you'll say the first swear, but not the second one. Cock. <laughs> and if you want to watch a film from this comedic genius over here, go and watch Arthur Braxton, uh, the drowning of. The Arthur Braxton, the drowning of, um, Prime Video. <laughs> on Video Prime. On Video Prime. <laughs> Hashtag on not spot. Zon Ammer. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, what I was talking about here is that I was really having trouble with this episode because I could not find anything to do with it. Initially, I did some sort of preliminary research. research. I found a website that um, sort of, uh, cor- like, you know, sort of um, what's the word when you bring together? Um, Com- collated. Compiled, collated. Uh, yeah, sort of compiled, collated a bunch of different sort of studies. And I just, I had a quick glance. So I thought, oh, great, cool. So there's there's some studies there. I've got something to work off of. I can build an episode in that grand. Then when I actually went to sort of start researching and look into them properly, I realized that a lot of these studies aren't about aromantic people to be, like, uh, specifically. And a lot more of them, all of the rest of them that are about aromantic people, do not meet my standards for including in Psyguy's episodes as scientific articles. There are surveys and whatnot, but they're hosted on blogs, and I cannot myself go through and sort of, um, I guess, what's the word, uh, assess the the sort of like method- methodological, um, the, the myth- methodology yeah. of it. So I, it, it, I was scraping the bottom of the barrel here. And that's not, and that's not me here being lazy, by the way. I want to be very clear. It's not laziness from me that has resulted in a sort of difficulty of finding aromantic studies. There are very few of them. Mm, there I'm are sure. so few. Uh, a lot of them look at asexual people and aromantic people um, sort of at the same time. So the first one I got, though, um, was uh, it's called Queer Intimacy is a New Paradigm for the Study of Relationship Diversity. It wasn't specifically about aromanticism, but it did mention it. It was quite interesting. So it kind of talks about a new paradigm for um, study. Um, basically, when you're looking at queer people, um, you know, there's there's a there's a sort of difference in the way that queer people approach lots of different different parts of life in that we don't fit into the sort of traditional boxes. And so you necessarily then need to have a new sort of way of building these studies. And there's other things you need to take into account. And it, it brings up um, aromanticism um, alongside uh, asexuality. But um it says that these sort of things need to be um, identified, uh, sorry, addressed in empirical research, right? So essentially looking at sort of how people navigate sort of normativity of society uh, is something that we need to be looking at. Um, building a study with the knowledge that queer people are probably going to break the norm in a number of relatively predictable ways, right? Um, that's what that study was about. It was really interesting, and I think you should definitely have have a look at it if, you know, if you want to if you want to learn a little bit more, because it, it discusses a lot of different things um, with regards to the queer community. It's not specific to aromantic people, um, but it's, it's, it's definitely um, very interesting. Um, the next one I've got is Ace and Arrow, Understanding the Differences in Romantic Attractions Among Persons Identifying as Asexual. That's from 2019, so only about four years ago. 
and it is um, it is basically looking at dramatic attraction amongst asexual people, uh, which it was an, it was an interesting one. Definitely, um, they looked at uh, it was sort of a I think it was a meta analysis. So they looked at um, a, f- a few different. Um, a few different papers. So yeah, that was sorry, not a meta analysis. It's a secondary data analysis um, on demographic, behavioral, psychological, and physiological measures as a primary objective, and compared asexual people to allosexual people on some measures as a secondary aim. Essentially, what they were doing here is they is they have analyzed data that they've already collected, um, and they're sort of looking, asking a new question, essentially, right? Mm. And the, the sort of question was, what's going on with asexual people and romantic attraction? So the study found that 74% of asexual people uh, were experienced romantic attraction, essentially, mm. they, that's what they reported. Um, there wasn't a significant difference um, between sort of the distribution of men and women amongst mm-hmm. the um, aromantic and romantic asexual groups. So within asexual people, um, whether you're aromantic and romantic, being a man or a woman doesn't really affect that. Mm-hmm. However, uh, there were more women and non-binary people in the asexual group compared to the allosexual comparison group. So allosexual meaning um, experiences sexual attraction mm-hmm. and asexual, obviously, you know, not experiencing sexual attraction or experiencing low to little, um, little to no ex- sexual attraction, right? So um, essentially, between asexuals and allosexuals, there's more um, uh, women and non-binary people amongst the asexual group. But within the asexual group, you don't see a sort of gender split looking at sort of between the aromantic and romantic asexuals. Um, so um, what it goes on to sort of say is what I think is kind of interesting. So romantic asexual participants reported a diverse range of romantic orientations with only 36% uh, reporting a heteromantic orientation compared to 76.2% of allosexual participants. So essentially what they're saying is only 36% of the um, asexual people who aren't aromantic, um, they were straight. So a they small were, amount. Were yeah, not yeah. very many of them. Whereas 76% of the allosexual ones, the people mm. who do experience sexual attraction, were straight or, heterose- or heteromantic, right? So the study also found that people who were asexual and romantic, so that's asexual people who experience romantic attraction, that they were more likely to be in a romantic relationship at the time of completing the survey. Mm-hmm. Um, on top of that, they were also, they were reporting more past sexual and romantic partners, so mm-hmm. more relationships and having you know more sexual partners. And then also more frequent kissing than aromantic asexual people. Mm-hmm. So this is this is just being compared between asexual people who are romantic and aromantic people who are asexual. That was a confusing way to say it. Um, <laughs> Aeroase people, so aromantic and asexual, and romantic and asexual people. That is really interesting because, you know, one of the things we we said at the top of the podcast was the idea of like, you know, romantic attraction and that being correlated with things like cuddling and kissing and these these sorts of things. Um, and so that's, that's very interesting. That's essentially a study that indicates that, yes, the act of kissing, although we might think of it as a romantic act, it is also like by the results of the study, it is a romantic act, as opposed to, for mm-hmm. example, a sexual act. Yeah, no, absolutely. Ex- exactly, right? Because you, to some extent, you can determine what is what between these two different sort of, between the sort of fuzzy lines between sensual and sexual, mm. you know? Because you can have you can have a platonic kiss. You can have a platonic hug. I mean, a kiss is where people would usually draw the line, right? A kiss is strictly sort of sexual or romantic, mm-hmm. but... People can kiss their friends platonically. That's fine. It's just, if you think about it, you just have a body and some things feel good on it. We've just culturally (laughs) placed a lot of baggage onto feeling good in specific ways. You know, you're only allowed to feel good in this way with this kind of person. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, hell forever. (laughs) Um, (laughs) But they also found, um, they they found, they said they found differences in personality as romantic asexual people were less cold, more nurturant and more intrusive than the aromantic asexual group. I, I don't know how <gasps> completely at odds with what you said at the top of the episode. Yeah, but then I don't know. Again, like this is one of those things where sometimes you might find things in studies that, you know, you're kind of looking for. There is there is the I mean, there is the almost implicit bias of, you know, someone who isn't romantic being cold mm. that likely could be a con- confounding factor. I'm literally just reading what it says on the page. Yeah, no, sure. But again, don't that's not that's not a fact of 
um, aromantic people. That's something that they found in this one very specific study mm -hmm. um, amongst that cohort. So it doesn't necessarily... It wasn't even actually studying yeah. aromantic people. It was studying yeah. asexual people. Yeah, absolutely. And <laughs> some of whom happened to be aromantic. Exactly. And on top of... Well, no, they were looking at... Yeah, yeah. They, they decided to look at the, the differences between the asexual mm -hmm. um, romantic people and asexual aromantic people. But they also said that there was no difference between um, these these the following demographic characteristics. So the likelihood of having children, solitary sexual desire, psycho, psych, physiological sexual functioning, frequencies of masturbation and sexual fantasy or depression. These similarities and differences between romantic and aromantic asexual people highlight the diversity within the asexual community. So bear in mind that this isn't, um, like I, I guess when you say less cold, more nurturant and more intrusive, those words have a lot of baggage. I've seen different studies that talk about different sort of attachment styles. Again, it's um, not a lot of these go very deeply into a sort of aromantic people as as a whole. It's it's something that just hasn't really. It's not got a lot of data behind it right now. Mm -hmm. So it was really difficult to sort of build this episode. I, I kind of see where I kind of got a picture of where the sort of field is right now, and it seems like we've kind of made some some big step forwards with um, asexual research. We've kind of really started to shift away from the this is a problem that needs to be solved and more of a sort of let's try and understand um, why these people are the way they are and how this affects their lives and all of these sorts of things. You know, just accepting this as a way that people are and trying to understand it more deeply rather than, you know, saying this is a bad thing and we want to figure out how to stop it. With aromantic people, um, we're kind of at the point where it's like, okay, this exists, but it's not an identity in its own right. You know, that's where the science seems to be at this point. And I'm not saying that scientists are out there saying that it's not an identity in, their own, in its own right. What I'm saying is that it really is often only studied as an addendum to asexuality, mm. which has made this episode really, because I, I really did not want to come in and just talk about um, asexuality, but that, that I, I I am at the whims of the studies that I can find. It's really interesting as well, because you said it there, in, in, in the top of that study, there's something like, something roughly like 75% of a sec. Asex uh, asexual people in that study were not aromantic. Mm -hmm. So the conflating of the two is, at least in that direction, yeah. is sort of, you know, by that study you can't rule out a s romantic as a sub subsection of ins inside a mm. sexual, but if you did a study, like the opposite study, of a a romantic people, how many of them are asexual? If you had a similar sort of number of like three quarters are, uh, three quarters of people who are aromantic are not asexual, yeah. then they're just different things that sometimes are sort of "Quote unquote co comorbid," but then also it's very easy to come up with an explanation as to why you might see more asexual people identifying as aromantic. Um, in the same, it, it's it, I would almost say it's a similar thing to why you might see more trans people not being straight, because once you've already, mm -hmm. or you know, more autistic people being transgender, once you've already kind of broken the social, uh, the, the social yeah. rules in one way, you know, you're more likely to explore that in other ways. And it's what I was talking about earlier. So I kind of poorly just described that three dimensional graph. And I kind of want to touch back on it again, because these, these different spectrums that I'm talking about, these different axes, you know, you've got from, you know, like your the strength of your romantic attraction, right on, on one axis. So like on one end, I experienced basically no romantic attraction on the other end, I experienced a lot of romantic attraction, right? That means that people can be anywhere on that, on that line, mm -hmm. right? And where we decide to draw the line between normal and <laughs> not normal is arbitrary. It's an arbitrary line to draw. And the normal, not normal is also arbitrary, right? You could say normal meaning most common, but most common also depends on where you're drawing that line to decide wh which the big group is, right? Because I'm ginger. Is that not normal? It, no, it's not. Uh, yeah, it's true. No, but it's not. It's abnormal. But like it's it's as we love talking about this, it's yeah. like as common as being trans, it's yeah. being ginger. Mm -hmm. It might be even more common. No, sorry, it's being intersex. Intersex, intersex sorry, yes, yeah. intersex, yeah. Yeah. So that's like super interesting because there are loads of gingers. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I know a bunch of gingers, and I probably I actually do know a bunch of intersex people as well. But the thing is, right, that we are so locked into the little categories in our head where we're like, ah, yes, there is aromantic and romantic, and there's, there's a very, very clear line. No, there isn't. No, there is not. In fact, if we were to be very realistic about this, every individual person is probably somewhere on the spectrum of romantic, of like sort of strength of romantic attraction. And the sort of one of the real sort of ways of determining whether someone is aromantic or not 
is whether they feel that their romantic attraction is sort of low enough or conditional enough or, you mm. know, any of these sort of things to feel separated from the, I guess, normal sort of group, the group that is sort of societally um, deemed as being normal, right? If you fall enough outside of that, internally you feel that, or externally you are receiving pressure from society because you fall just a bit too, you know, a bit too far outside of what is deemed normal. That would be what kind of um, defines you as being aromantic. Mm. But then it's the same as so many of the other things that we talk about here, right? Like that line isn't going to be exactly the same for everyone. What someone is able to recognize in themselves or recognize a sort of societal oppression for, for you know, um, being aromantic or having um, less romantic feelings than most other people someone else may not recognize it as that. Mm -hmm. you know, someone else may not um, feel that pressure as much and therefore may never identify themselves as being aromantic. There are also combinations on that graph that um, would look normal, that mm. that's, it might be outside of the norm. For oh, yeah. example, you could be somebody who has high levels of um, romantic attraction, low levels of sexual attraction, mm -hmm. and low levels of sociosexual um, mm -hmm. impulse. And so that would lead you to be in a monogamous relationship. The person you're with might have sexual attraction and you do that because you have high levels of romantic attraction and you care about them. Mm. Or you could have high levels of, like, low levels of sociosexual, so you don't want to sleep around. Um, you are highly sexual. And you're not very romantic, and mm. you just set up a romantic relationship because it's a way because you are, you want to be with one person, you want a constant source of sex, but you don't feel a lot of romantic attraction. Yeah. But on the outside, it'd be like what a normal relationship with normal people. And you're just hitting extremes as well. Like, yeah, do you know what I mean, absolutely. Like, like if we're scaling this from one to ten, you know what I mean? Like you're hitting ten to or zero, or you know, scale it from zero to ten. You're hitting some of them at ten, you're, yeah. some of them at zero. You're min maxing here, but yeah. realistically, people are just a whole mess of mm. different like you know points on that graph. So, you know, it's 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 not as it's not as simple as 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 it may seem. But, you know, there's some other studies, you know, this one looks at sexuality, sexual behavior and relationships of asexual individuals, difference between aromantic and romantic orientation. Um, you know, and that um that says this goes on to say that romantic asexual inv individuals are more likely to have romantic intimate relationships and maybe more open to the possibility of having sexual activity. So, you know, if you're aero ace, then you're in some ways more stereotypically asexual according to this study, right? You know, you're less likely to want to engage in sex, less likely to be in sort of a romantic relationship, even though there's there's no reason that an asexual person, you know, wouldn't necessarily want to be in a, uh, in a romantic relationship, you know, just on the basis of being asexual. So, you know, um, this this is, this is, it's interesting, but again, it's just, it's, it's really not based on aromantic people. I couldn't really find any studies that were just, just about being aromantic. Um, I mean, like all of these studies, as I said, are about asexuality. And again, I did not want to make this episode about that, but such is the way, such is the way of, uh, you know, science right now, which kind of comes down to a matter normativity, which I'm sure you could guess what that means. Well, it is the, oh, because you were talking to me about this, about uh, a study about James Bond movies, were you not? Was that you? I don't know anyone else who'd be quoting a study about a matter normativity in James Bond movies other than you in my oh, life. Oh, do you know what that was? That was me telling you about uh, studies that I thought I'd found. Uh, I, I was me telling you about the studies that I'd found. And one of them was uh, was not a study. It was, I think, an essay um, on James Bond movies looking at a matter normativity in those. So a matter normativity, I would assume, would mm -hmm. be the sort of normalization um, and by extension the unnormalization of the opposite mm -hmm. of romantic relationships. Yeah, and you know, I said we were going to get onto this topic at the end, but we've kind of been talking about it quite a lot throughout. I mean, the real takeaway is that the world is not built for you if you are not interested in romantic relationships, right? I mean, you could be single your whole life. That's certainly kind of possible, but you'd need to share a place with someone in all likelihood. Like, it's not, it's not super possible mm. for someone to live really by themselves um, easily, in London at least. You know I mean? Like it's kind of a difficult thing. Your expenses just balloon and it's, it's, it's not as straightforward or easy as, you know, finding a partner, marrying them, getting the tax benefits, mm. getting all of these things. It's, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a whole different ball game. And, and on top of that, there are just sort of social expectations as well. You know, if someone's not in a relationship, it's seen as a, as a sad, mm. sad thing. Like, mm. oh, they've been single for this long. Maybe they don't want to be in one, mm -hmm. you know, or or even then there's there's expectations in romantic relationships, you know. Um, so if you're on the aero spectrum, but you're finding yourself in a romantic relationship, 
there's going to be expectations that you might not be able to meet because you just don't feel that way, right? And it, it's essentially it's essentially the same sort of issue as heteronormativity, right? Like we have expectations that we place on people just as a rule, and if you if you fit into those expectations you're golden. You won't even notice that they're there really. Because I mean, like, it's almost like saying, yeah, everyone's telling you to breathe air. And you're like, yeah, I, I yeah, but I, I just do that. I, who, care, who cares if like, I'm, if I'm expected to breathe air, I need to breathe air. You know what I mean? Like, that's just what I do. But if someone is unable to breathe air, if you're talking to a fish man and, and he comes up onto land and, and, and he's like, why is everyone expecting me to breathe air up here? Why are they making? Why why are they not letting me wear my 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 breathing gills? You know, and breathe water. Um, my breathing gills. I'm talking about like a big like, a, like a, yeah. <laughs> you know? But like you know, and and you're like, what are you even talking about? No one is expecting you to breathe air. But yes, you just don't you don't notice the, the sort of pressure that you get because it's not affecting you, right? Like there are a lot of societal pressures to do a lot of different things. I mean, from the minute that you were born, it's expected that you're going to grow up to get married, right? Mm -hmm. People talk about it, um, you know, for for your whole life. And little girls often will plan their weddings as children, right? Because that's what they're expected to do. And as soon as you find out that you don't fit into that mold, you don't have a script, you don't have a map, you're lost. I've spoken mm -hmm. about this before, but the issue here with sort of imaginormativity, as I said, is the same as any kind of normativity. It's just kind of crushing people's uh, crushing people out of existence if their experiences don't fit what is determined as normal. And that's a bad thing. And we should stop it. We should just let people do what they want. So long as they don't hurt people. Try and find a problem with that. <laughs> wow. What a crazy woke opinion. <laughs> well, with that woke opinion, it's time to get to my favorite part of the show. <gasps> it's a quick for our quiz. Dun 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 dun. I don't love you. Oh. That's okay. Thank so, you. So, Luke, the rules for the quick fire quiz are the same as they always are. I will ask one question. That's one question between you and the audience. If you get the answer right before Luke gets it right, then you win. But you have to answer the question after I finish asking it. Is that all good with you, Luke? That's fine with me. So here is the question. Are you ready? I am ready. That was not the question, but oh. here is the question. Name a type of relationship other than romantic. Ah! <laughs> Why are you buzzing? Oh, sorry. I don't need to buzz. I just need to beat you. Uh, other, heterosexual. <laughs> No. Uh, what other than romantic? Oh, platonic. Jesus. <laughs> Friendship. You lost Parent that. Parent-child. You lost that in so many different <laughs> ways. You you really bombed that one, buddy. Oh. I'm sorry, but that was that was a terrible effort. Let's try and bring it back with the thanking of the patrons. So Thanks. Every single month, we thank our new patrons by name. Yes, we do. And I would first like to thank Eden Dallison. And I, for one, would like to thank Victoria Cherepanova. Thank you to Leona. Thank you to Yang. No Yin, though. <laughs> thank you to Yin. I mean, thank you to Dale Sanders. Thank you to Kenny A. Grace. Thank you to Toast. But <laughs> but screw you, bread. Only Toast. <laughs> thank you to Aki4397. Yes, that's correct. Off the top of my head. Off the dome. <laughs> and thank you to Jasmine. Thank you to Brenolin. Thank you to you, Tob. <laughs> <laughs> that's what it says, you, Tob. Thank you to August Lewandowski. <laughs> These names are brilliant this month. Thank you to Peep the Toad. Thank you to Alien Wandering. Thank you, Randall. Thank you, Caspian M. Thank you, Christopher A. Butler. Oh, Christopher's a, is a, one of my patrons as well. He's a butler. Thank you to Ronja, or Ronya, or Ronja, or Ron, whatever other way there is to pronounce the letter J. Ah. Thank you, Emily Payne. Shut up, Corey. And finally, thank you to Kia, or Kea, or whatever. I, there's lots of different pronunciations of, of letters. Kai. Thank you all. I think. But that is it. So thank you very much for watching. We'd like to thank all of our patrons with an extra special thank you to executive producers Tonito and Glitch Rabbit. And again, thank you for watching. You can find the full references for this episode down in the description. Subscribe to new episodes every Sunday and Monday. Leave us a nice wee comment. You can support the board at patreon.com forward slash SciGuys or you can find a contact us at SciGuys board on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube and uh, SciGuys on TikTok too. That's right. Or you can send us an email at SciGuysPod at gmail.com. That's SciGuysPod at gmail.com. SciGuysPod at gmail.com. You can follow me at NotCore everywhere. You can follow me at Luke Cuffworth everywhere. Goodbye. Go away. Go away.